in the rank and rancid emptiness between dusk and dawn lies. Episode 1. Something else came by James Stanker. Edward sat down on his bed. Everything was held in silence in the sanctuary of candlelight. He adored the dark figures it painted upon his walls, loved the canvas they created for the looming figures to preside upon, and often he would lay back on the bed and examine them, imagining what they were, what tales they told. He picked up the black and white photograph of his long since departed mother, her starchy image captured in an ornate picture frame. There was a sudden, tentative thud. Fragile quiet shattered. He groaned, placing his hands over his face, stubble overgrowing his shallow, ageing skin. The divorce from Petula had been efficient and final. The spoils were the four-year-old daughter under his ownership. He heard another reluctant knock at the door and shouted from his chair. Helena, don't hit the door, you silly girl. You shall spoil the paint. He cursed, annoyed at the child, and turned the door handle with a click. You are seven minutes late. He snarled, his small blue eyes firing disdain upon his ex-wife. Helena was slack-jawed and worried, Petula only smiling weakly a glance between them conveying a shared knowledge of Edward's fearful temper. Edward simply cracked a smile upon his granite chin, looked down at his daughter and withdrew the smile like the coiling of a displeased snake. To your room, child. Nothing here concerns you. As she turned to kiss her mother farewell, his eye caught something. A small patch of blood dried below the corner of her bottom lip. His eyes slid like dreadful silk, meeting Petula's eyeline, letting her know that he had found out a secret. Suddenly, he was oily charm. That's right. There's a good girl. Off to bed with you, and I shall follow shortly, my dear. With a fake grin and affection encased in ice, he cleared the field to attack Petula, calculating his battle plan. Mother and daughter blew final kisses to each other before the little girl headed up a foreboding set of winding stairs and disappeared into her room. What have you done? He gripped Petula's long chestnut hair and pulled it back so that she was forced to glare directly at his ruddy, furious face. She gasped (gasps) and stammered. The blood on Helena's face. How the devil did that happen? His wide eyes drew closer to her, his neck contorted and vein-ridden like the organic machinery of an insane piston. She broke a baby tooth on the biscuit I bought her today. That's all, Edward. I swear. With vicious ease, he flung her off her feet and down to the floor. Her forehead smashed against the cold marble of the hallway. He advanced over her, tempering his footsteps with steaming fury, stemming the fluency of his actions, clogged with an unreasonable desire for violence. He lowered himself over her frightened, sprawling, gasping body, drawing over her prone frame like a thunderous phantom. I'm going to see that you have destroyed you, virus, you bacterial presence. You cannot despoil my child any longer. He grabbed her arm and frog-marched her down the hallway, chucking her outside as if he were disposing of a damaged ragdoll. He threw her bags at her along with a gift she had purchased for Helena. Do not test me, woman. You are on your last chance. Do not spurn and insult my generosity. The door slammed. Edward stormed back into the house, his footsteps thundering up the stairs to his daughter's room finding her with her hand twisted under the pillows, whispering about tooth fairies. He breathed heavily, like a large, frightening dog. I won't have any bloody nonsense about tooth fairies. He growled, and turning with contempt, closed the door. He returned to his room to sit and brood and lounge, like all the other nights spent with a whiskey bottle in his right hand, and his left tracing crawling fingers over the edges of the black shadows on the wall. Like a culture of germs, the memories spawn throughout his brain. His mother. His father's death chamber. There are only tooth fairies for bad adults when they are on the wrong side of God. His mother hisses. Pitch black souls with leather skinned, sinewy haunches. Wasteful, childish fantasies. 
Helena's endless chatter of fairies and wizards and unicorns and mummies magic. He dozed on and off. He was awoken by the shuffle of feet above him and exhaled a strong cloud of whiskey breath, irritated, but resigning himself to breakfast duties for the girl. He found himself at the table opposite her, his chin resting sluggishly on his hand, eyes displaying a dwindling life energy that accompanied a grey skin tone. Helena, dear, he slurred. Why on earth are you wearing mittens inside the house? The child bowed her head like a scolded puppy and dropped her spoon, cowed by Edward's intimidating glare. He was growing irritated. Remove those stupid mittens. His face was an ugly grimace. Do not defy me, child. Do it now. He slammed his fist upon the breakfast table, the skin around his nose and lips stretched tight. Nobody dared to step out of line when he was at the helm. He had reduced grown men to tears, quite gladly. Helena, now sobbing, pulled off her mittens for her father, moving in a jagged manner as the trauma threatened to overtake her body. The gloves fell to the marbled floor with a soft puff noise, and she held her hands out. Edward gasped. There was a graceful little ring with an elegant bottle-green gem at the crown on his daughter's finger. A quizzical look glanced over his face. Where did you get that ring? Helena pointed to her mouth. The tooth fairy left when she swapped it for my tooth. He left the table in a rage, his chair screeching against the floor painfully. Stupid child, did you steal it? She stammered once again about the tooth fairy and watched as he stormed into the hallway and picked up the telephone. He mumbled as he dialed, his free fist clenching and unclenching. Petula. I'll not waste time. Should you see my daughter again, then get yourself down here at once. He slammed the phone down, growling. One of them must have stolen the ring. She had gone to touch those ones, and he told her they were grandmothers, that grandmother would come out of the shadows and drag her to hell. He grabbed the girl's hand and started to tug at the ring to prise it away, as Petula arrived terrified and dumbfounded. Leave her alone, you mad bastard! Leaping towards him, she wrestled him to leave hold of the girl. Helena, screaming in pain and fright, in danger of falling over and having her finger broken. Edward was too strong. Petula swung her hand back and <gasps> scored her long red nails down his face. The reaction was instant. He yelled in agony and relinquished his punishing grip on the girl. Petula screamed. Run, Helena! Run to a magic place in the house. He had heard that before in the haze of his drunken rampages. It was somewhere around the child's old room, he knew that. Had heard singing drifting from somewhere hidden, somewhere secret. Edward turned to face Petula, her eyes full of fear. Towering above her, he slowly removed his belt and gave a sinister grin. His eyes absent for a moment as he noticed the shadows on the hallway wall that flickered and formed into shapes. He felt instructed his next move. Petula was terrified, <gasps> gasping for breath, looking up in fear at him as he slowly turned the belt in his hand into a noose. He watched her scramble backwards, her spine on the floor, her hands desperately trying to push him away. He stomped towards her, teeth bared like a wild animal. You knew there was a price to pay for breaking my rules. He was stooping over her now, attempting to still her head in order to place the noose around it. Now I'll put you in a place where you'll never be able to reach anybody. A sudden dull impact on the side of his head. A strangely warm sensation, coupled with a dizzy fuzz. He dropped the looped belt and was dimly aware of Petula's sudden burst of nitro strength and speed up the stairs, escaping his clutches. He stood for a moment, and as his senses began to clear, he spotted the object, an iron doorstop. He felt his cheek. He felt the blood, could even taste it in his mouth. In fact, there was a lot of blood coming from his mouth. He felt his teeth with his tongue, noted that the canines and molars and incisors were fine, but touched the big bloody cavity on the right of his jaw. He scanned the floor for his missing tooth, found it scattered a few feet beside him at the kitchen doorway, picked it up and put it in his pocket. 
He stomped up the stairs, his gallows belt at hand. You can't hide! He shouted with a bloody gargle. I know where you are! He could picture them, huddled, surrounded by damned fairy lights and those infernal pixie ornaments they loved so much, glitter on the walls of their hiding place, that stupid bubble machine. He shouted louder, made them know where he was, knowing their hysteria would grow as he grew closer to them. His heavy footfall thundered against the walls and made him sound like a monstrous stone-clad tyrant. His breathing was feral. He couldn't hear them at all. He could see the child waving that infernal ring, rubbing it with her little fingers and singing that they had help. He hissed at the air. I'll wait. I'll get you. I'll get you. Oh, wait. He languished in Mother's room, as he had done time after time, sitting on the chair by her beauty mirror, slouched, another whiskey bottle hanging limp from his fingertips, a glass tumbler long drained, using a torn piece of cloth to stem the bleeding from his gums and the alcohol to dull the pain, watching the dancing shadow people that alighted upon the wall by the flickering candlelight. His senses were dimming, his rage making him tired. He stumbled to the bed. He reached for his tooth and examined it. Still healthy and porcelain white, it would surely fetch a fine fee from any passing tooth fairy. He placed it under the pillow as the folklore wisdom told, and fell into a heavy slumber, perplexed by mystical outcomes. Mother smiled thinly, a smile that made her eyes edge at the sides like a hunting cat. The boy shouted, She is real! I saw her! He pouted on the edge of tears. Mother's eyes were like glacial orbs with no sign of melting. Edward, you fanciful boy. Why must you persist with this wasteful nonsense? She sneered and was visibly irritated by the boy's precocious attitude. What you saw, she whispered, was not the tooth fairy. The opposite, my dear child. What you saw leave your father's room is what comes to adults. Bad adults. What did Mother mean? Was Father bad? And what did he do wrong? He began to sob gently as Mother flapped the pages of her newspaper. Her upturned nose and pinched mouth, hair limp and straight, her skin icy in complexion. Such a silly, unnecessary child. She sniffed. The shadows flopped and wriggled on the walls, the candle spreading its menial light throughout the room all the while. A cold, sharp breeze snapped Edward awake, an icy air that made him draw breath. His head hurt. The moon poured its silver glare into the room, and a single soil-encrusted earthworm dropped onto his cheek. He flinched in shock and flicked it off him. The partly decayed flying fiend, its skin pale in some places, in others charcoal black with worms pouring out of its wounds, wounds like scorched burnt craters, was hovering over Father. Father's body lay cold and still lit by invading moonlight. The bad fairy had a tool in its claw, and flapping its leathery bat wings, drove the flat side of a hammer into Father's mouth, smashing his teeth. It repeated this action until there was nothing left save shattered enamel and a bloodied, violated maw oozing red liquid. The fairy collected the broken pieces of tooth in a small hemp sack and flapped off out of an open window. Edward thought of fairies and unicorns, pixies and dragons, magic rings, secret hiding places and protection. He could hear a flapping, but it wasn't the curtains. It was more like leather. It was not the Tooth Fairy. It was something else. Something Else Came was written by James Stanger and narrated by Georgina Ragazza. Chris Hibbard was the voice of Edward. C was the voice of Petula, Helena and Boy Edward. And Georgina Ragazza was the voice of Mother. The Graveyard Shift is produced by Laurie Hajitura.